Um, and as entrepreneur to entrepreneur, if I said this sentence that the best opportunity for any entrepreneur is where the highest risks are. Welcome back to the Money Seed Podcast. My guest today is Emmanuel Daniel. Emmanuel is an entrepreneur. He's an author. He's a consultant. He's a world traveler. Emmanuel, welcome to the show. Gabriel, very excited to be on your show. Uh, and just to offload to you uh, all of the things that I've been experiencing, uh, both as an entrepreneur, uh, as well as uh, as a professional in the finance industry. Emmanuel, well, where does your story begin? It sounds like you've lived in numerous countries. You've traveled to over 100 countries. You're an expert in finance. Where does it all start? Well, I was born in Malaysia, which is part of uh, Southeast Asia. So that's the part of the world that I come from. Uh, I finished college in Singapore, and that's a name that you know everyone knows around the world. Uh, and then um, I built a business uh, around uh, the finance and the banking industry. At first, it was the Asian banker, uh, and that gave me the excuse to travel to every Asian country. Uh, and the country that I spent a lot of time in was China. Uh, I was very, uh, you know, very privileged to be uh, to have a front seat view uh, of the developments taking in China uh, in in the years that it was rising rapidly um, as an emerging market country. Uh, and then I extended my business into the Middle East uh, and then into Africa. So I have offices in Dubai, in Beijing, in London, in New York. Um, and, um, and then now I'm, I'm making forays in the U.S. Uh, on the financial services industry side, uh, you know, running study tours um, and, um, and trading sessions and so on. Um, now, in the meantime, as I built my, my business, uh, I also, um, you know, developed an idea of where the future of finance is going. And so I published my first book, uh, you know, The Great Transition, The Personalization of Finance is here last year. Uh, so that's where I am today. Most guests on my show are very America focused. Most of my guests are from America. This is a land of opportunity, but you have more of an international perspective. <laughs> Where else do you see opportunities outside of America and how should American investors look at international opportunities? You know, this on this point, um, I speak as entrepreneur to entrepreneur. Um, and as entrepreneur to entrepreneur, if I said this sentence that the best opportunity for any entrepreneur is where the highest risks are, uh, I think that it would um, coincide with um, what a lot of the entrepreneurs on your show would would uh, feel or think uh, or realize. And when we think that way, uh, we, don't, we don't become afraid uh, of places which are dangerous, um, um, you know, in dire situations. Uh, we just keep looking at them to figure out uh, what the opportunities uh, would be. Uh, and then we have to overlay uh, what our own personal preferences are, our own personal skills are, and what value we bring uh, into these uh, opportunities. So whether you're thinking about within the US uh, or anywhere in the world, you start by thinking uh, you know, where the risks are, where the disconnects are, uh, where the circle is not being you know, completed, uh, where you can play a role. Uh, you know, I was telling you, Gabriel, that um, the uh, transport infrastructure for private transportation, okay, this is over and above Uber, uh, in the state of Maine, uh, is dominated by one Iraqi family that were immigrants, uh, you know, about 20 years ago. Uh, and apparently, 150 members of the family live in just about, you know, the same region. Uh, and the owner of the business who took me on one ride from Ogunquit to Boston told me that at a height uh, before COVID, he had about a hundred odd vehicles um, that he that he owned, and then uh, provided uh, the whole transportation infrastructure for that region. In other words, if you call for a private car anywhere in Maine, you would be calling one of his uh, drivers. Um, so that's a, a, an opportunity that he built uh, and very quietly dominated. Uh, and you you would think that you know how is it that this infrastructure didn't exist before? Uh, you know, and, and how did he quietly build it? And this sits over and above Uber because 
Uh, the problem with Uber in small town USA is that there are not enough vehicles uh, to, to service the town. So half the time when you're calling an Uber vehicle in Oganquit, for example, uh, you only have three cars available. And so you've got to make an appointment before you, you get a vehicle. So right there, there's an opportunity. So opportunities like this exist everywhere in the world. Uh, we just need to um, identify them and be humble enough uh, to build the first bricks or, you know, of the whole wall uh, of the business that we, we can uh, build and dominate. And, and very often these opportunities um, exist in places that you, you know, least expect. Uh, you can, you know, land uh, on a holiday in Zanzibar in uh, Africa uh, and, then dis and then discover that the pharmaceutical industry doesn't exist, um, you know, and that um, in the pharmacists have not figured out how to build dispensaries uh, in Zanzibar because all the dispensaries are on the on the uh, you know on the Dar es Salaam, the the capital side of, of the island, okay, on the other side on the mainland of Africa, um, and right there, there's an opportunity. So um, and starting a business means that you've got to overcome a number of things, like the transportation guy in in um, in in Maine or the you know dispensary business in in uh, medic uh, the pharmacy business in. In Zanzibar, uh, you might discover that the reason it doesn't exist is because the local mafia dominates, um, you know, the little pocket holes in there. So you got to work the local network to to take it to another level to to build that. Uh, and so that requires a lot of uh, EQ, <laughs> the ability to deal with human beings, uh, and then and then the business model uh, falls in place, uh, and then that calls back. Uh, to the vision, uh, the, the, the bravery, uh, and, and the patience uh, of the entrepreneur. So I've seen, you know, one of the nice things about traveling around the world as I do, uh, is that you capture uh, instances of opportunities that exist anywhere in the world. Uh, and Americans should um, always start with a global perspective and then bring it back to the US. I mean, in other words, sometimes when you live in a very well-developed part of the country, uh, Texas, uh, you know, uh, Florida. Uh, everything is so well built up, uh, even on the social front, that you think that there is no opportunity. And then you go out to the country and maybe you went to South America and you saw that there was a delicacy that uh, Latinos like in South America, which, you know, doesn't exist in Florida. And right there is an opportunity that you can bring back into the country. Um, you know, so that's how my mind works and that's how I see opportunities. Are there any countries or regions of the world where you think Americans have more success than others? And I'm thinking of maybe the business climate or how easy it is to move money in and out or how friendly the laws are or how the rule of law holds up. What are some of the what are some of your favorite places to invest? China. Uh, you know, I know a number of American entrepreneurs in China. Um, now, one of the first things you need to uh, come to terms with when, and as an American, uh, you do business anywhere in the world, is that um, that you're always a visitor. You're always the foreigner. That um, the reason you are going to be successful is because of a value that you add um, that the locals cannot add. So, for example, I am very successful in China. Uh, the Asian banker brand name that I brought into China uh, is highly respected in the country. Uh, and the reason it is, is because firstly, we were there when the country was just opening up its banking system in 2000. Uh, secondly, we were foreign uh, and getting validation by a foreign publication, a foreign brand name was very important to the Chinese banks. So all of the banks invited us into their offices and said, come look at what we're doing, you know, tell our story to the rest of the world, um, you know, and uh, give us recognition that that, uh, we dis uh, we, that we desire. You know, do you, are you going to have a conference in our, in our country? We will speak at your conference. We will not speak at the conference of the local guy because yours is more prestigious. So um, leverage on the on the prestige that you bring into the country because you're a foreigner. 
Um, you know, and so in that regard, one of the wonderful things about being American is that, yes, um, you know, uh, people in many countries uh, despise Americans, are angry with America for all the things that it does. But the strange thing is they also desire the respect of America. Uh, you know, they are the friendship of Americans. Hmm. Uh, you know, look at Vietnam. Uh, it was a country that America just completely almost destroyed in 1975. And the humiliation of having to see a helicopter, you know, being uh, pulling away from the American embassy in Saigon in 1975. And guess what? Today, um, the connection between America and Vietnam is the highest that it ever has been. Um, and uh, Vietnam holds its relationship with America uh, as being very important, the highest uh, alongside its relationship with China, which happens to be a neighbor. Uh, and any American, especially American Vietnamese, going back to Vietnam uh, starts uh, on one step up uh, the pedestal uh, in terms of opportunities. Um, you know, and um, uh, the Vietnamese girls will want to marry you. Um, you know, the Vietnamese businessmen want to have you uh, associated with your business so that you can speak American and, and uh, bow them with the value that you bring into the marketplace. Americans uh, enjoy uh, an incredible, um, you know, uh, pri privileged position uh, almost anywhere in the world. Uh, then you, the third level is where you add the risks involved uh, and whether you want to take that risk. Um, you know, um, in Burundi, for example, one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, I discovered and I met uh, with the owner of a satellite television network who was Chinese. You know, so the Burundians and more than one Burundian said, oh, would you like to meet, uh, would you like to go and visit the uh, satellite TV station? And and I and and then they told me that it was run by a Chinese. So so I and and just about every Burundian, um, you know, subscribes to this satellite TV station because the government, the state, is not able to build the you know regular television station network. You know, so this Chinese who doesn't speak a word of the local language or French or German, uh, you know, dominates that industry. Uh, you know, so if the Chinese can do it, not even speaking the language, and this is one Chinese family in the capital of Burundi, uh, in right in the heart of Africa, one of the poorest countries in the world. You know, so uh, Americans should take uh, you know advantage of the um, of the immen immense goodwill that you have, uh, and then do something with it. The interesting thing about American entrepreneurs around the world is that. Uh, it's half and half. There are a few who have succeeded, um, you know, running small coffee shops and stuff like that. But a lot of Americans who go out, uh, go out with the aid mentality. Uh, they don't mind mm. being part of an NGO, uh, a non-government organization, uh, or, you know, of uh, the US aid uh, program where the US government funds your trip. So I go to a country like um, Mali, and in Tim Timbuktu, uh, the funny thing about, and you know, you, in order to go to Timbuktu, you got to arrive in Bamako, which is the capital of Mali, and then travel for one and a half days across the Sahara Desert to get to Timbuktu, right? So I arrive in Timbuktu, and what do I see? I see an entire street of NGOs, officers, okay? And, and these are American and Canadian and some European uh, non-government organizations uh, that purport to bring value to the local uh, community, uh, but they only turn up, you know, two or three weeks in a year, uh, you know, and uh, and they think they're doing good for the local community. Uh, so Americans have to get out of that aid mindset uh, that that you're relevant to the rest of the world only if you're helping them to get better. Uh, and here's where um, the Chinese model offers an alternative, a viable alternative that Americans really need to uh, you know, internalize, which is that the Chinese go out to other parts of the world to build roads, to build hospitals, to, to run restaurants, uh, you know, um, and to open um, you know, departmental stores, you know, small um, emporiums. And when I look at some of these departmental stores, I look at them and I say, wow, there's a bit about a, a million US dollars worth of inventory in this store, in this humble looking store, um, you know, and, and anything can happen. We, the, the, the store can be raided, there can be a racial riot, 
Um, you know, they, they can be robbed. Uh, and yet, this Chinese family is willing to do that. But every day that they're there, uh, they are making available cheap goods uh, to the local community so that the children can grow up well, uh, they can have access to uh, global goods and services, um, you know, whether it's medication or just, um, you know, stuff that they need for the house or just school textbooks for the students and so on, uh, which then helps the local community develop uh, and function like local communities anywhere in the world. And that is a far more valuable uh, contribution uh, that an entrepreneur can make uh, to a local community. Uh, and it requires a lifetime of uh, commitment. Uh, and it very often comes from the entrepreneur's own, uh, um, you know, own exasperation, own hunger. Um, you know, when I meet some of these Chinese entrepreneurs, I ask them, where do you come from in China? And very often they come from the poorest part of China. They come from provinces like Gansu, uh, you know, Guangxi, um, where, uh, and one of them told it to me this way. Uh, whether I go to Beijing or to New York, um, you know, or to Bamanko, uh, um, the opportunities for, I mean, the opportunities and the risks for me are the same, you know, and, and then they choose the, the most difficult parts of the world and they raise their kids there. Uh, and after 10 years, uh, a few of the people in that community get together and they set up a private school uh, to which they then fund it and they bring in good international teachers and then they build uh, the private schools then scale and the local population starts to go to the same private schools. You know, so it's just an amazing way in which entrepreneurship uh, creates more opportunities than charity. And it sounds like it takes several generations to to work its magic. As you said, it takes a long commitment to make it work. Uh, it is a lifetime commitment for most of the entrepreneurs who take this opportunity. But we don't need to think about generations. Uh, we just need to think about our own situation, uh, you know, and and the opportunities that exist in your home country. If you're comfortable, you're not never going to leave, uh, you know. But if you're not comfortable. Uh, and you know that you need to make a decision to, to scale, uh, to generate wealth for your own family, uh, and that, that opportunity doesn't exist in your, you know, your immediate surrounding, that's when you get hungry. And, and then that's where you make decisions that helps push you into uh, places that you never thought of going before. Um, you know, and that's a very, very personal thing. And wherever you go to, you need to be uh, comfortable. Um, you know, there is this uh, Chinese uh, family that I know about in Papua New Guinea. And the problem with Papua New Guinea is that um, everything around you is tribal. You know, the, the tribal guys are carrying the machetes uh, in their hands, uh, you know, when they come and visit your store. And this guy's wife left him because she just couldn't take it, right? And and for some weird reason, he just decided to stick there, stick on. And, and he runs the biggest uh, department store in the capital city of Papua New Guinea. Uh, you know, so it's actually a personal story for everybody, uh, for anyone entrepreneur. You know, so uh, you, can, you can start an American fast food chain in, Fra in the south of France and still enjoy it. You know, the French are so bad with American food that, I mean, they love their own food very much uh, that, that if you started something, they'll be disgusted with you. But, but you know, some, uh, you know, French young people might like you because France is a country of immigrants. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because I think you're absolutely right in that every entrepreneur at some point has to get out of their comfort zone. I think that's just part of being an entrepreneur. You can't get around it. We are having the we are having the right conversation here. So you know, while I'm giving you these examples, we just keep going back to the core themes of what it means to be an entrepreneur. All right, let's switch the topic to finance a little bit. You are a finance expert. I think recently you were voted as one of the top fifty voices in fintech in the world. Your recent book, The Great Transition, talks about many topics, including decentralized finance. Um, Tell us what is what what does that mean decentralized finance? Well, traditional banking, and I'm sure most of your entrepreneurs are uh, familiar with this, is to go into the bank and get a loan uh, and scale your as the assets that you want to invest in. And very often it starts with property, and that's uh, 
the, the theme that is strongest on your podcast channel. And, and all of that is right. Um, so what is happening today is that there is an alternative model growing and it's going to grow bigger uh, in the future. And what is the alternative model? Uh, it is that by leveraging uh, and coagulating information uh, on what people need uh, to have finance, uh, there is an alternative financing model that is evolving that uh, we need to start thinking about. So for example, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer platform industry, um, what is it, what, the way it functions is that uh, it brings together uh, borrowers and lenders onto a platform and helps them talk with each other uh, so that they can find each other and bypass the traditional banking system. Um, now, a lot has happened in the industry that the peer-to-peer -peer model is itself going through some changes. Uh, what happened to the original peer-to-peer -peer players is that uh, they, uh, they well, the, the, the single most important problem that the peer-to-peer -peer players had was that they labeled their products as being the same as banking products. So, so when, when they were trying to match uh, buyers and sellers of property, they called it a mortgage. Um, you know, but by calling it something else, you, you, you actually unlock uh, your mental uh, definition to, to create new types of financing models that didn't exist before. So an average mortgage is five to 30 years. Um, you know, the bank holds the deed to your property um, and, and, you know, and, and then you, you leverage that again to get your next property and so on. Now, if um, what it is, is a timeshare or, uh, or a lease, um, you know, that creates new opportunities. Or if you can break down your loan requirement from you know, the 80% that you need to take a loan on uh, to, and, and, and divide it among, say, five different lenders for, for different periods, um, you're able to create uh, a whole financing structure uh, that will help you manage the whole process uh, and then frees up your assets or your, your, your liquidity uh, to you know, borrow uh, uh, on other things that you want to uh, build on. Now, and then you add the cryptocurrency, uh, the tokenized uh, way of uh, lending, which is uh, to put uh, a deed, for example, on a blockchain uh, and, and make that um, available for investment by thousands of different um, you know, investors. So all of these technologies are only just uh, taking shape. We are still in the early days of the process. Um, and then the regulators come in and keep trying to force this, you know, this decentralized finance uh, model back into the traditional banking industry. Uh, in other words, they want to you know, make the decentralized model um, a banking model instead. Um, now, why is it called decentralized? Uh, the, the goal, the dream of decentralization is that there is nothing between you and the borrower or the lender, right? So uh, you don't need an intermediary, which is the banking system as we know it today. And the banking system as we know it today is very expensive. Uh, you know, the, the loan, the, the rates that they charge for the loan, the fees and, and so on. Uh, and the dream is that uh, one day that you will be able to interact uh, with your counterparty, whoever it is, um, you know, in a free and open way over a platform, uh, or you can create uh, an investor community around yourself, although who you are is just an individual. And that is why the, the title of my book, The Personalization of Finance, is here. You know, now, uh, in stating the direction in which finance is heading, uh, it's a long journey. And we have just started maybe two to 3% of that journey. And into that two or 3%, what we see is that regulation is trying to dampen the process. And in fact, the venture capital funding base uh, of the decentralized finance uh, model uh, also re-centralizes, it, it, it reintroduces a new form of intermediary, which is not the banks anymore, but the venture capitalists. Uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, it's counterintuitive uh, and, and it's an irony. Um, so we're still in the early days in that way. 
Now, what's, what's still taking us in the direction of decentralized finance is the onslaught of the availability of information uh, uh, and the information revolution uh, that is uh, you know, still charging in that personalization journey. So what we have today is that if you go back to the peer-to-peer -peer player model, uh, in the early days, when the peer-to-peer -peer platforms brought borrowers and lenders with each other, they tried to put a mortgage product in there and, and match the borrower and lender with each other. Now, when you have 10 borrowers and lenders meeting each other, then you say, okay, what can we, uh, how can we you know, arrange this deal? And, and then you go back to the, you know, the, the, the models that exist, which is banking mortgages, uh, and then try and recreate that. In other words, you at, or at the end of the day, you sign a mortgage deed uh, or you assign your mortgage deed to your borrower and uh, your, to your lender and so on. But when you have 10,000 borrowers and lenders meeting each other on a platform, and then you put the AI on top of that, the kind of deals that they're going to end up making is way beyond our imagination today. You know, So that's the direction that we are heading. So think chat GPT, think you know, how in one sentence you can construct a, a, a lending model. Uh, think about blockchain technology, which can carry your asset, which is say, for example, your title deed uh, on a, um, a digital platform. And, and then you can you know, uh, disperse your assets into a thousand different um, you know, mo lending models uh, all on its own. Um, it's going to be transforming the industry as we go along. Now, uh, I want to make it very clear that, that there is a difference between imagining the future and traveling on the road. Um, and when you're traveling on the road, you might not see how this future is coming along. And as you're traveling on the road, there are lots of um, you know, new developments that, that uh, get into the way. Uh, and one of the new developments that are taking place is uh, the the desire of central banks uh, to issue central bank digital currencies, for example. Now, the problem with that is that central bank digital currencies stand in competition with stable coins and with cryptocurrencies. Um, and what central bank digital currencies are trying to do is to try and recreate uh, the amazing technologies that are being developed on stable coins and on uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, and why is there an amazing sense of development? Because these developments are taking place on open source, meaning that um, any number of programmers, engineers, dreamers, application developers can get onto any of these platforms and contribute and personalize that platform for themselves. Now, the problem with central bank digital currencies is that central banks are not going to allow anyone and everyone to get onto their platform to generate their own applications and so on. Um, so that is why I think that central bank digital currencies have very limited um, you know, prospects um, and uh, they cannot match the energy that is being generated on stable coins uh, and on uh, cryptocurrencies. But that whole journey um, will be you know, sort of manipulated by the different players, including the regulators, um, and they will try and create a kind of a hybrid model uh, that will work for all of society. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it depends on the end user. What do you use it for? Um, you know, if nobody uses a central bank digital currency, it will just drop out of usage. Uh, you know, but if a stable coin, you know, presents itself and enables itself to be uh, to have people create applications on it, it will just blossom uh, and 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 define finance as we know it. So, so that's the uh, journey that we are on. Uh, and that's something that you really need to have at the back of your mind to try and imagine what the future of finance will be, uh, the kind of assets that will be available to you for investment uh, and, and what um, you know, role you can play uh, in, in developing these assets and whether you believe in them or not. Do you think we will see a CBDC here in the United States? And if so, when? Short answer, no. Uh, I'm just flabbergasted that Janet Yellen can issue a white paper and, and, and float it around. The, the interesting thing about people who are central bankers, and Janet Yellen, although she's Treasury Secretary, her pedigree is that of a central banker. 
you know, and and uh, is that because they are unelected officials, uh, they have, and and I say this with a great sense of uh, wonder that this can uh, even exist, which is that they are disconnected with everyday people. Um, so what I do is I go around the world, and I've met Janet Yellen before, uh, and I've met um, you know uh, many central bank governors around the world, and I and I have private meetings with them, and I have private meetings with the central banks that have already issued central bank digital currencies, uh, and their single biggest problem is to get the banks to cooperate with them to to release central bank digital currencies into the economy, and why will the banks not cooperate? Because there's nothing in there for them. You know, you go to a country like Bahamas, 99% of the economy is Americans swiping their credit cards uh, to make payments on, on the, you know, on, on the tourist stuff that they buy uh, in the Bahamas, uh, 99%, okay? Uh, and when they swipe their credit cards, um, a whole army of players uh, get paid in the process, okay? So the credit card companies get paid, uh, Visa, MasterCard, the banks on both sides of the equation get paid, the ISOs get paid, um, you know, the processing centers get paid, and so on. And so there's a whole uh, gravy trail of uh, players uh, who are monetizing payments as we know it today. And if you want to change payments to something else, uh, you need to say, what is it in, in there for them? Uh, you know, and the, the big thing about a central bank digital currency model is that you don't need these intermediaries. You only need the central banks. But um, in the digital payment uh, pro you know, infrastructure that exists in other parts of the world and are superior to the ones that exist in the US, for example, China has WeChat and Alipay. India has its Adha program, which has UPI, universal payment infrastructure, uh, and so on. Um, the, the incentivization process for the banking system uh, to, to buy in and to support the process uh, requires the central bank uh, to have a huge funding base to make that transition. In other words, they need to use digital money. They have to use marketing money uh, to to you know enable these players to to uh, support the process. And I'm not even I haven't even got to the point where Americans in general distrust government, the state. Uh, you know, Canadians in general distrust the state. And it's amazing that in Canada. One year after the truckers riots, where the state switched off the bank accounts of the truckers, uh, that you know has uh, has had a um, a profound impact in the back of the minds of every Canadian that the state cannot be trusted uh, to um, you know to control the banking account, let alone issue a central bank digital currency, and yet they still go on uh, with their CBDC trials. Um, so. The way I see it, um, it is uh, it is a stillborn child. Uh, you know, it's a technology that uh, looks very credible, but uh, central banks, um, you know, don't have a chance to uh, to bring it to life. Uh, this is the way I think. Uh, if I saw something else that showed me that it's going to work, uh, I would I would support it, uh, and I would say uh, I can see how it's working. It did have central bank digital currencies did have a uh, potential of becoming alive in countries like Nigeria, where um, you know they issued a CBDC, and then because they were not issuing enough cash into the economy, physical cash, um, many of the pensioners uh, didn't have a alternative but to receive their pensions in CBDCs, but they couldn't deploy that. Um, and then as soon as cash became available, the CBDC project just fell flat on its face. Uh, and everybody talks to me about China uh, being a CBDC, um, you know, um, poster child. Uh, and then I say to them, uh, the project started in 2014. They went live in 2018. It is now 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, five years, and they're still on pilot. Uh, and yes, they, they generate a lot of numbers uh, in terms of uh, use cases, but something is wrong. Uh, why is it still on pilot? Because they're afraid of going live. Um, you know, and uh, and uh, and and they are um, they are afraid of being the first to go live on a nationwide uh, basis because they don't know what the repercussions will be on the economy if they went live on the CBDC project. So please don't show me the China um, uh, you know example as the poster child. 
um, you know, and in fact, the, the, the people who started the project have all been assigned to other projects right now. So something is not right in that, in that uh, project. And uh, all of the usage numbers that we see in China uh, are actually discounted uh, or rather incentivized um, uh, usage cases. In other words, the state has to spend money uh, to give discounts on the on the on the payments uh, in order to incentivize. So, in other words, people are using the payments uh, CBDC um, uh, infrastructure only because it's cheaper than uh, the um, the regular digital payment infrastructure, which already exists and is uh, highly developed in China. So, the state doesn't have resources to continue to subsidize. Uh, the use of uh, CBDCs. Um, and the state or any state that wants to issue CBDCs has to understand the reason that some of the digital payment uh, pay, uh, you know, games of, uh, players who have succeeded so far have succeeded because they were incentivized by venture capital companies that were willing to put in billions of dollars uh, to, to start to see scale. And states are never able to do that, and especially central banks, which are not well funded in the first place. You know, so um, so based on all of these factors, um, I don't see CBDCs taking off in the U.S. It's an interesting mood point. It's a point for discussion, uh, and it brings us right back to personal liberties. And in China, it's an interesting case because in China, of course, Jack Ma's uh, Ali Group or Alipay. Uh, was a very large and probably still is a very large, very influential company. And when they wanted to go public, the Chinese government kind of put their foot down and and uh, basically said, "No, this is not. You're not going to become that huge that you're going to be. You're going to have an outsized influence on the Chinese economy." Which is an interesting way. So if it's if it's not CBDC and the government is not comfortable with a private company controlling a big chunk of the everyday transactions of the people, then where's that Where's that middle ground where everyone can be happy? It's an interesting question to ponder. I'm curious about your thoughts on that. And maybe a third alternative is what's happening now in El Salvador, where Bitcoin is now accepted as legal tender. What are your thoughts on those two? Yeah, so the, the first point that you raised, um, the way to structure it is to, to talk about the rise of the state. Uh, as an uh, important player in the economy. Um, you know, from the days of Ronald Reagan, uh, where the state is the problem, um, you know, we've now gone a whole circle where state is a player uh, and the state is able to fund a lot of the infrastructure. And, and I'm, uh, when I say this, I, I'm talking about uh, disparate states as different as Japan, China, India, uh, Germany uh, and the US uh, and, and Burundi as well, okay? Because uh, interesting that when I arrived in Burundi, uh, they had a very well-structured ability to handle uh, the COVID situation. Uh, you know, you had to fill in a software, uh, they send you a QR code and all that. And in the past, uh, dysfunctional states just didn't have that ability. Uh, and actually COVID raised the uh, the consciousness of the state to say that hey we can be part of the solution uh, you know and and gave uh, gave them a fillet in terms of um, you know the ability to play an important role in finance and today funding is getting easier for states in other words states as different as China and the US can issue debt as much as they want and there are people out there or investors out there who will buy their debt so so today we are seeing the state and the private sector. Uh, coexisting uh, alongside each other. Now, the interesting thing about the Alibaba or the end financial story is that um, when we think about all the magic that has happened in China, we need to uh, put that in a time perspective uh, between the year 2001 when China joined the WTO and today. Uh, and in that period, uh, we need to break those periods up uh, into the periods when the state was still dysfunctional and depended a lot on private sector uh, to provide an infrastructure. And it, uh, so, for example, the rise of Alibaba and, uh, uh, and WeChat, for example, uh, that happened between 2004 and 2012, uh, where uh, these players were able to go to the U.S. market and raise an enormous amounts of capital, $300 billion, uh, $350 billion in the case of Alibaba, uh, and WeChat and so on, uh, and then bring it back into China uh, and build the infrastructure that the state was not able to do. 
Uh, and then came the state in that period uh, started becoming uh, competent. Uh, you know, they didn't even have the laws in place uh, to, to control the rise of Alibaba. Um, and then eventually uh, data protection laws, uh, payment system laws, uh, and even the agencies that, uh, you know, build this or rather operate these laws, uh, they were brought to a national level instead of allowing these players to operate at a, at a, at a, at a, at a district level, at a, um, at a local level, at a provincial level. So um, all that took time. Uh, by 2014, the state became very uh, competent uh, and started to put in place rules uh, that controlled Ali, uh, Alibaba and, 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 uh, uh, and WeChat. Um, you know, and by 2018, the state started to uh, come up with its own alternative models. Uh, and by 2020, the state uh, was looking at the private sector place and saying that, you know what, we're going to start taking control of you. Uh, we want you to be part of our model, forgetting that these private sector models were, 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 fi were financed uh, by foreign money. OK, so so that's where we are in the journey of China. So when we want to project the role that China is going to play, uh, we cannot assume that the factors that existed in 2014 exist today or to, existed in 2018 or in 2023. So whether it's China or Germany, for example, uh, or Japan, uh, the state assumes that it has the capacity to finance a lot of the innovations taking place uh, in the private sector. Uh, you know, and 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 then they want to emulate the development of companies like Tesla, uh, and you know, and and Rocket Space in China, private companies uh, that want to invest in in uh, space technology, they they're on the rise. Uh, you know, just like the AI companies have been. Now the question is how um, how open is your capital markets going to be uh, to be able to support this infrastructure building uh, and this new frontier technologies um, and uh, to what extent uh, are you going to allow foreign capital to to um, to influence that process? You know, so um, and to be honest, uh, the world's most aggressive uh, capital markets still remains the U.S. Um, you know, it's a punishing marketplace. Um, you know, it, it it punishes losers like it punished BlackBerry. You know, into oblivion, uh, and and it and it rewards. Um, you know, potential players to a point well over uh, the, ability, the ability of other players to dominate. So if you take uh, SpaceX, for example, for a very long time, the world's cheapest, um, um, you know, launcher of satellite uh, was India, uh, you know, and, uh, and that was funded by the Indian government with very little money. Uh, and for a few, you know, thirty thousand dollars or something, you can actually have a, a satellite uh, launched into space. Um, and then, and then SpaceX came into the picture and reduced the cost even more. Uh, and that's because SpaceX is funded by capital that the Indian government will never be able to match. But today, the Indian government is putting out even more money uh, into the space program because of prestige. And the reason the Chinese government uh, is able to you know, come up with very credible um, space program uh, initiatives, such as, uh, you know, replicating the space station model is because of the amount of capital that they are putting into the program, but they do it at the huge expense of other things that they need to do. And at some point when that capital, um, you know, meets a brick wall, uh, then you start seeing, um, you know, that, that it starts to unravel, which happened in Russia. You know, uh, Ronald Reagan bluffed the Russians by, you know, coming up with this amazing uh, space program. What did he call it? I forget, it was a very lovely name. Uh, uh, Star, Star, Star Wars, yeah, the Star Wars program. The Star Wars program, uh, you know, it, it was a bluff, but the Russians rushed in to match that uh, and they just didn't have capital to meet it. You know, so um, any, Technology can be created by any state, uh, but at what cost, um, you know, and, and, and at what uh, infrastructure of capital uh, that you need uh, in, order to, uh, in order to make that a reality. So that's what we are dealing with uh, on the state control of uh, leading technologies today. Um, you know, and uh, I think that the, the Chinese state's desire to be the owner of innovation 
uh, has a huge cost to it uh, that uh, no state has shown its ability to match, not even the US government, by the way. Uh, you know, the US government always provides uh, seed funding uh, through companies like SRI uh, in, in California. Uh, and very often that money comes from military. Uh, and then the company goes off into the capital markets to raise the rest of capital. Uh, you know, so to the extent that other countries uh, replicate that model. Uh, and then on top of that model uh, is the attitude of states to the information revolution, uh, that you really need to have an open book uh, in terms of where information is taking you to. So if you take uh, what ChatGPT is doing to us today, uh, if a state tries to uh, you know, control it to, to curate the process, uh, they kill the very innovation that, that they're trying to create. Uh, and yes, that innovation comes with a huge price to the state. Uh, and the dysfunctionality that it causes in the US is the price that the US is paying right now that no other country in the world is willing to. Um, and also, uh, so my, my sympathy uh, goes to the US for having to be at the frontier of these developments uh, and it pays a huge price. And the rest of us are basically recipients. Um, you know, we, we get to pick and choose what aspects of these innovations that we want to uh, benefit from. Um, you know, so that's where the state of play in the world is. And your second question was? Was about Bitcoin in El Salvador. What are your thoughts? Oh, yes. So I was in El Salvador. Uh, and I did meet some of the, you know, senior people. And I vis visited uh, Bitcoin Beach. Uh, saw it in action. So the first thing I, I learned when I was in Bitcoin, when it was in El Salvador, is that how will something like Bitcoin ever become currency, right? And and the, the experience that gave me a glimpse of how that happens is when a girl at, the, at Bitcoin Beach told me that uh, as long as my rentals uh, and my income are in Bitcoin, I'm good. You know, so in other words, your assets and your liabilities have to be in the same uh, asset or same token, right? So, so she didn't have to worry about the fluctuations. And at that time, when I visited, the fluctuation was enormous, and it still is. Um, you know, but uh, we need to create ecosystems where both the income and the expense are in the same, uh, you know, uh, token, um, and we don't have to worry about exchange rates and so on. Now, there are several things that are not working well in the Bitcoin program in El Salvador. Uh, the imagination was that Bitcoin would make the remittance business cheaper. Uh, it didn't. Uh, you know, you still pay a high fee for uh, transacting Bitcoin. Uh, and El Salvador has a, I think it's a $40 billion remittance uh, industry. Uh, El Salvadorians in the US sending money back. And, and it was... Uh, the hope of the El Salvadorian government that, that this will form an important pillar of the Bitcoin economy. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, however, they're chipping away at it. Uh, they're creating uh, users uh, of Bitcoin in their e local economy. So, um, you know, they, they have to change a few laws uh, in order to be able to pay even uh, government taxes and, and stuff like that in, in Bitcoin. Um, they are they are the firstborn child of of the Bitcoin revolution, uh, and even if they fail, uh, they are setting in place a number of infrastructure that other countries will will take on. Uh, and here um, we need something to happen to Bitcoin itself. Um, it has to reach a point of being over invested uh, for for the price of Bitcoin to collapse. And when it does, it becomes immediately utilitarian, uh, you know. So I think that... Uh, so, so, sorry, Emmanuel, walk, walk me through that process so I can understand it better. You're saying it has to be um, over-invested for it to collapse and then become utilitarian. So where we are now in the Bitcoin revolution is that Bitcoin is not a mode of payment. It's an investable asset. Um, you know, and anyone who uh, buys a Bitcoin or most people who buy a Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, tries to hoard it uh, in the hope that it goes up to a hundred thousand. And I'm doing the same, by the way. Right. So uh, and hoping that it becomes a million dollars and so on. And it will rise in value as new players get on stream. So right now, 
the fact that corporates or corporations in the US have added Bitcoin to their asset base. Uh, and in 2025, banks and central banks will be allowed to hold um, Bitcoin into their balance sheet. Uh, the price is going to keep going up, um, up to a point. And above a certain point, like any investable asset, uh, it is overpriced. And when it's overpriced, it starts to dismantle. Um, you know, and we see this in technology stocks, for example, which is that the, the basic inherent uh, uh, case for technology stocks uh, or technology itself is that it commoditizes. In other words, Tesla fine tuning and perfecting battery technology doesn't give it an added advantage. It's just the first player in battery technology that's going to be played by everybody else. Um, you know, and then at some point, Tesla's uh, value will just collapse, although the technology itself is continuing to grow. Uh, and that's what happened uh, at the start of the 19th, 20th century when Henry Ford perfected the process of manufacturing uh, thousands of cars at the lowest cost, uh, you know, possible cost. In 10 years, there were 2,000 car manufacturers in the U.S. 2000, okay, uh, just about every small company in your neighborhood was a car auto, automobile manufacturer. So something like that will happen to Bitcoin. Uh, any technology uh, that has an inherent value will be commoditized at, at some point in its, uh, in its lifespan. And when it's commoditized, the price collapses. Um, you know, and when, it, when the price collapses, that's when it becomes universal. That's when it uh, starts to be able uh, to perform the function that the technology it carries was intended to. Um, you know, so we will get there. Uh, it's just that uh, the building blocks right now are at the stage uh, where there seem to be a value in holding to the asset um, until its utility supersedes its value. Uh, and it's commoditized. When I, when I use that phrase, the utility supersedes its value, um, some investors use that to justify the price of a stock, uh, you know, but when but they don't understand the second half of the sentence, which is that which is to commoditize the technology. Uh, you know, so I do see that uh, Bitcoin will be commoditized at some point and the countries that have built the infrastructure, that's when they have uh, the, op the, uh, the opportunity to turn Bitcoin into a regular payment systems. Um, so in that way, uh, uh, El Salvador is a firstborn child. Uh, the decisions that it's made uh, to make Bitcoin um, currency just alongside the US dollar that it does, um, is a price that it's paying for at the moment. But at the same time, uh, it's building a lot of the use cases uh, both on the payments front, as well as on the capital markets front, as well as on the technology front. They, they have this dream of building a uh, fintech hub uh, in one of the volcanoes, uh, two of the volcanoes, uh, to be able to you know, derive energy from the volcano and, and uh, create a um, Silicon Valley in, in uh, El Salvador. So a number of things are, are, are being developed uh, all at the same time. So don't take any... Uh, downside risks that you see on um, what's happening in El Salvador uh, as uh, premature news of the demise of Bitcoin. It's work in progress. Are there any particular cryptos that you are really excited about? You know, some people are excited about Ether, some about Ripple, some about Bitcoin, anything that really excites you. So Ripple, for example, uh, the way they've played the ground is that uh, they started by trying to be a defining crypto, but uh, they ended up uh, being a, a normal IT developer for any form of payment infrastructure that the client wants. So anything you want, Mr. Client, you know, that, that's how uh, Ripple has turned out to be. And they, they're trying to keep justifying the use of the X, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the token uh, as the uh, universal um linkage in cross-border payments, uh, but that's only one of several models that exist today. So uh, so I see that Ripple will be just become uh, a normal IT company uh, in that way. Now, the interesting thing about Cardano and, um, you know, uh, Filecoin, for example, 
is that um, they have the technology being developed on their platform. Uh, and uh, Cardano, for example, has uh, capital market products uh, built on them. Uh, and uh, um, and there's, uh, there's a several in, in that way. I forget their names now. Um, Tesdos uh, is another one. Um, uh, they have interesting um, use cases built uh, in capital markets. Uh, these use cases need to scale. Uh, however, the alternative use case models on blockchain as well as on platforms just generally without the use of blockchain are also developing alongside. So um, a lot of the capital market mo mo products that are being developed on crypto uh, are work in progress that, that are not, um, you know, uh, are not definitive enough. Um, Ethereum um, is too expensive. And, uh, and because of that, um, the alternative models have uh, evolved. Uh, my my uh, faith in the crypto model is that uh, is to look at the number of programmers that are involved in any uh, uh, in any crypto uh, infrastructure. So uh, Cardano, I think there's like three hundred thousand programmers or something like that. You know, that's what I hear the number, right? So uh, so th this is where uh, we will see. Um, you know, the innovations taking place. Um, now, having said that, the same 300,000 are also involved in something else, you know, in, in any of the other uh, models. So the, um, the, the biggest problem of crypto is that because they are venture capital funded, uh, they end up becoming centralized again. You know, so they need to break out of the centralized, centralized mindset uh, and actually, I think that the SEC is helping them do that because every time the SEC declares a crypto as a as a security, they have to fight the system to say no, we are not. We we are open. We uh, you know we allow our members to do whatever they want. Uh, you know, and and no, we we're not guaranteeing any form of uh, return on incremental value and so on. So so the game is still being played, uh, and crypto has a new enemy, which is hardware. The number of servers that you plant around the world uh, and the technology that's required to build uh, chat GPT, for example, uh, is the same technology uh, that is providing an alternative to what can exist on a, uh, on a, on a crypto platform. So Filecoin, File, Filecoin for example, um, you know, uh, it's meant to uh, uh, enable uh, the sharing of files uh, on the network, uh, but um, you know, chat GPT type model um, offers another alternative to Filecoin. So, so we are seeing a state of play um, you know, it is not important to be either crypto or traditional. Uh, it's important to still keep an open mind uh, to see where the technology is taking us. You did bring up Chad GPT, and that'll probably be the last major topic we hit on today. How does Chad GPT and finance overlap? This is what I'm telling my banker friends that. When the product doesn't change, nothing changes, okay? And the most important thing that is going to happen in finance is that the conversation is going to be the product. And many bankers have no clue what I'm saying. Uh, what I mean by that is that coming back to the peer-to-peer -peer model is that in the first early days of peer-to-peer, the peer-to-peer -peer platforms were happy to have 10 borrowers and lenders talk to each other. Now, that's going to change when 10,000 borrowers and lenders talk to each other. They will, between themselves, find meaning that the traditional players, traditional banking players, don't see today. Uh, and that meaning is not going to be encrypted in, you know, in, 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 words, like, uh, in words like mortgage or investment or you know security or um, you know a structured deposit it's going to be um, encrypted in words that we don't um, know today and that's what finance is going to be um, now the first thing that chat gpt does to banks is to make them look at their existing infrastructure especially their core banking systems where data is maintained in disparate parts of the bank, 
And, and today, GPT enables a bank to immediately see all of its data all at once. And then the banks that have all the data in disparate systems like JP Morgan do deals with companies like Bloomberg to come up with their own version of chat GPT that aggregates their own information. The problem when banks do that is that they end up selling their same products back to their customer. So in other words, on chat GPT for banks, when the customer asks a question, the answer is still my product. Okay, and what banks don't realize is that the data that sits outside the bank is more important than the data that sits in the bank. And so finance as a concept has to, um, has to move out of its inward centricity to being open uh, to all of the possibilities that exist outside the institution. Um, you know, so you take um, Aladdin, the beautiful product um, that uh, that BlackRock has, right? Um, which is a risk management system that takes into consideration it's you know it's Bloomberg plus ten other infrastructures all in one. It's an amazing product that they have built from the old days, which now you know is being uh, revolutionized with uh, with chat GPT type infrastructure. And what they do is that take all of the factors that exist around the world uh, and create risk pro profiles out of that. And, um, you know, and chat GPT um, empowers Aladdin even more. Uh, they need to do that, but they need to now be outward looking. The data that sits outside the institution today is more important than the data that sits in the institution. And so these are the ways in which finance is being revolutionized. What it means to the end user is that you now have the ability to create your own finance product. Um, you know, if you have a mortgage requirement, you use this um, ability to uh, collect information from disparate financial institutions and create a product that is specific to you. Now we're not there yet, but that's the direction in which we are heading. Excellent. Emmanuel, thanks very much for joining us today. I got one final question for you. I know you've been to over 100 countries. What are your top three countries to visit? You know, the funny thing about people who travel and visit many countries is that um, that's the one question that they don't want to answer uh, <laughs> because it's so important that we keep an open mind about every country that we visit. Uh, of course, in the early days of traveling, there are countries that I keep going back to because I they they fulfill a basic uh, primordial um, comfort. Uh, you know, countries with a lot of carbohydrate food uh, because I like sugar. I like uh, you know I like rice. So you you go back to these countries that have Thailand, for example, such beautiful food uh, and and so on. And then you get and then you mature into countries that challenge you a little bit uh, you know so you can't go to Canada without being an out, outdoor person there's nothing there are no shopping malls in Canada to hang out in uh, you know you just have to go out into the mountains uh, and enjoy it uh, you know in Switzerland for example so so there are countries that take you out of your comfort zone and and help you to uh, you know to to enjoy um, you know a life that you otherwise didn't have I mean I come from Singapore which is a uh, uh, it's known as a shopping mall country. Uh, you know, the heat of the streets outside makes people, you know, enjoy, you know, mulling around the, you know, the, the shopping malls instead. And, and, and when you go to Calgary in Canada or Vancouver, you go up to the mountains and you go skiing. So, um, so we all are a product of our own comfort levels. And, and those who live in those areas probably find the city, um, you know, overwhelming and, and, and quite uh, aggressive. Um, and then you start going to the difficult countries uh, and then you start meeting people uh, who teach you something that just blows your mind. Uh, like a little girl who would give you, um, you know, a, a banana, um, you know, a fried banana for free, uh, despite the fact that she's poor, uh, you know, and, and then it just blows your mind that the people in the countries that you come from would never do that, um, you know, uh, and it humbles you. So 
Uh, I think those are the things that I've learned. So when you say top three countries that I've been to, uh, that I like very much, um, uh, I would say that I would, um, you know, rather not um, answer that question. But having said that, there are countries that I need to keep going to. And on that front, the US is definitely one of them. Not because it's an easy country, but because it's a country that keeps changing on itself. Uh, and so I need to uh, plug myself into the changes taking place in the US. So during COVID for two and a half years, I didn't go into the US. And when I went back, I saw a country that um, is going through a painful stage. Um, you know, I, I in New York, when I go into the stores, uh, the whole uh, working model had changed from customer centricity to employee centricity. Uh, the stores uh, had become highly defensive of their employees. Uh, when I go into the into a store, I almost have to apologize, uh, you know, if I did anything wrong, which which I did do, uh, you know, uh, and and uh, and be very sensitive to employees. Um, and then I see uh, department stores where they actually lock up electronic goods. And then I'm asking myself, who are they locking it up against? It's not the customer. It's actually uh, from pilferage within the employee uh, community. So, uh, so and then I then I work backwards and I see why did the U.S. get to this point? And then I take it back to 1995, where um, you know the capital market was telling the employees that if you don't uh, keep your costs down, we are taking all these jobs out to other countries. Uh, you know, and it, it's a journey that has uh, you know taken the U.S. to where it is today. But um, it's a journey that the U.S. is willing to. Um, is willing to allow itself into because it just keeps renewing itself and then it reaches a new plateau um, where it becomes a stable society again and then breaks the rules and, and goes on to the next level. So I would say that uh, the US is very much a country that I remain engaged with um, you know, all through my life, my professional life and personal life uh, because it is the country that defines the rest of us. Emmanuel, that's, a, that's an excellent answer. Thank you very much for a fascinating discussion today. Emmanuel Daniel, the author of The Great Transition, and we'll put the links in the show notes. Thank you very much for joining us today. Gabriel, thank you very much for a conversation that drew on, on the things that I wanted to talk about today. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Money Seed Podcast. Please remember to click like and subscribe. It really helps spread the message to other investors and it helps attract new viewers to the show. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much.